Good morning, Zion. You belong here. We belong together. I'm Pastor Dwayne Jesse, pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Youngstown, Ohio, and today we are celebrating the third Sunday after Pentecost. Zion Lutheran Church is hosting live in-person corporate worship, and I want you to feel welcome to join us at either our blended service on Saturday night at 5 p.m. or our traditional Lutheran liturgical service on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. By the way of announcements, this Thursday, June 17th, we will be hosting our next What's Cooking at Zion drive through dinner. The week's featured dinner will be stuffed green peppers. To order your meals, go to the website zionohio.org and click on the Give tab or call the office. Then on the following Thursday, June the 24th, we will be hosting our next Red Cross blood drawing. Please go to the website redcrossblood.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS to schedule your donation. I want to thank you for your continued financial faithfulness. Hosting Red Cross Blood Drawings is just one of the many activities that Zion hosts that make your church vital in our community. Thanks to your regular contributions, we continue to serve our community. The special ministry emphasis for the month of June is Camp Frederick and Zion's own debt reduction. To make a special offering or to make your regular tithes and offerings, I encourage you to use the website zionohio.org and click on the Give tab. You can also use the Give Plus smartphone app and you can reach us by the U.S. mail. Assisting in worship today are Joan Gent, our Administrator of Worship and Music, on the keyboards. Dan Mook will be leading us in our singing and providing special music and will also be providing our prayers of intercession. Kari Wentz, our administrator of communications, produced this video. Eric Vargo edited the video and Stephanie Chismar edited the music. Now please join in singing our gathering song. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Graft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your truth and love to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from 2 Corinthians. St. Paul writes, So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense 
for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others. But we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. The Word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stock, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds of earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. During June, I am preaching a short sermon series on the readings from 2 Corinthians. Along the way, I intend to teach you a little bit about the Apostle Paul, the author of the two letters to the Corinthians, Corinth, the city and its people, some surprising theories about the two letters that are in the New Testament, and some issues that Paul faced with the Corinthian fellowship. So let's get started. I mentioned last week that the pre-conversion Paul, known as Saul, was a Pharisee. As Saul, he made it his mission to persecute the Christian movement. He saw this as his godly service to the Lord until his dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus. In Saul, the resurrected Lord Jesus saw someone whose passion he could use to build his church. Jesus broke Saul's misguided spirit, gave him the new name of Paul, and put him in contact with godly disciples who could teach him the truth of the gospel. Bible scholars think that this happened somewhere between 34 and 37 CE. By the time the Corinthian church was founded in 53 or 54 CE, Paul was a seasoned apostle for the Lord and his church. I also mentioned last week that Corinth was an important commercial and military community located on an isthmus. But I didn't tell you what an isthmus was. An isthmus is a narrow strip of land with sea on either side forming a land bridge between two larger areas of land. In the case of the Corinthian Isthmus, which is just less than four miles wide, the idea of digging a canal through the Isthmus was first conceived in the 7th century BCE as a way to create a shortcut, saving shipping time to sail all the way around the Peloponnese 
but a lack of canal digging technology frustrated the project for hundreds of years. During Paul's time, the isthmus was transversed by rolling ships across logs. There were several other attempts to complete a canal over the hundreds of years, but the present Corinth Canal was finally completed in 1893. So geographically, you can see why Corinth was an important commercial and military community. You might recall last week that I blew your mind when I told you that though we have just two of Paul's letters to the Corinthians in the canon of Scripture, there is evidence that Paul wrote five letters to the Corinthians. Two of them have been completely lost, letters referred to as A and C, and what we know of as 2 Corinthians is likely made up of letters D and E. And then I taught you a Greek word, adiaphora, and I taught you that the word means stuff that doesn't matter. And I told you to apply that to this new mind-blowing information. So today's readings and all the featured readings for this June series come from letter D, or the first nine chapters of 2 Corinthians. Today's sermon is entitled, We Are a New Creation. So let's get started. It occurs to me that sometimes Paul writes in riddles, or at least they sound that way to me. For example, in verse 6 and 7, he wrote, While we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. What he wrote here is this idea that builds on what he wrote in last week's reading, which is this affirming of this idea of an afterlife, heaven, eternal life. Perhaps you will remember me telling you that that concept was not widely held in Judaism, let alone by the other pagan religions in Corinth. So he affirmed the concept last week, and then he builds on it by writing that while we human beings are both spiritual and temporal at the same time, we are spiritual beings over and above our temporal beings. Temporal, meaning earthly, worldly, mortal, human. That is because our temporal beings are being wasted away. We are all dying. Short of the Lord returning during our lifetime, none of us gets out of this life alive. So if our temporal bodies are going to waste away anyway, we ought to be building up that part of our lives that is eternal, and that is our spiritual being. But pastor, all I know is this earthly life. I don't know what comes next, so how am I going to, so I'm just going to live life to the fullest and take my chances in the next life. I know, I know. Are you aware? that the Bible actually endorses that point of view? Yeah, read this from Ecclesiastes chapter eight. So I commend enjoyment, for there is nothing better for people under the sun than to eat and drink and enjoy themselves. For this will go with them in their toil through the days of life that God gives them under the sun. Now, I'm not going to tell you that Paul endorsed this philosophy. Paul was rather intense. I don't think he was born with a party gene, but some in the fellowship at Corinth still embraced some of those rituals from their pagan past. Do you remember that other Greek word that I taught you last week? Corinthias azomai? That was coined because, to, as a way to describe the immoral life that was commonly led by the first century Corinthians. 
Paul took issue with that low standard of the Corinthian culture and encouraged his fellowship to live up to the higher standard of a life of discipleship that he espoused when he wrote, we walk by faith, not by sight. He argued that a life of faith in God revealed in Jesus Christ calls us to a higher standard and yes, that higher standard calls us to not pursue every new, fancy, shiny, attractive, fun thing that we're confronted with. There is a greater goal to be pursued in the life to come that the Christian should aspire to. My argument with this line of thinking is that it presumes that a living a godly life is less fun, less rewarding, less attractive than living a godless life. And here I acknowledge that I have defined two poles, godly and godless. And I don't even know if it's possible for a human being to live entirely at one or the other pole. We all live somewhere on that spectrum. My position is that I enjoy my life. I enjoy pursuing my hobbies and interests that I have. I, those hobbies and interests are neither godly nor ungodly. They're just hobbies and interests. I enjoy the activities that I do. Many of them I do through the church. But I, if I didn't enjoy doing them, or I didn't like you, the membership, well, then you'd probably see less of me around. Fact is, I like you, and I like the way I feel when I do things with you. Do I enjoy sweeping the sidewalks of Cornersburg? Eh, not particularly. Do I enjoy sweeping the sidewalks of Cornersburg with you on God's Work Our Hands Day of Service? Immensely, I do. Do I enjoy driving around the community delivering grace meals to members of our congregation? Not particularly. Do I enjoy driving around the community delivering meals to members that I haven't seen in a long while? I sure do. I do immensely. I have chosen a life of faith modeled after my Lord Jesus Christ with you and the members of this church doing godly things. And that feeds my spirit. I admit it. I like the way I feel when we do something good together. And that is exactly the position that Paul takes. In Paul's first century, life may not have been so comfortable. He wrote of himself, we do have confidence and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Really? He'd rather be with the Lord now while his life is still going on? Well, let me ask you, if I told you I had a bus right on the outside of these doors waiting to, to take you directly to the Lord, would you follow me? Or as Marshall Applewhite told his Heaven's Gate disciples, there's a spacecraft trailing the hale Bob Comet that will take you to the rest of the way to Heaven's Gate. Would you follow him? I'm going to predict that you're going to say no on both cases, and that is because even knowing and trusting that what God in Christ has prepared for us for our eternity is far greater than this life that we live right now, we still want to know how this thing turns out. I want to see my children and grandchildren grow up. I want to see how they turn out. But let me tell you, I've been at the bedside of many a person who having lived long full lives or perhaps suffered from some terrible illness are ready to take their chances on whatever God in Christ has in store for them. Or as Paul wrote, we walk as yet by faith, not by sight. 
I suspect that something like that will happen to most of us. We will get to a place and time where we are ready, ready for whatever God in Christ has prepared for us, or home with the Lord, as Paul wrote. But I hope we all agree with Paul in the conclusion of that thought. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Did you know that that is the first objective of the Christian's life? To live a life pleasing to God? I agree with the great Benedictine monk, Thomas Merton, who wrote, I believe that the desire to please God does in fact please God. There is no standard of achievement of pleasing God. Either we do or we don't, and as Merton said, even an attempt to please God does, in fact, please God. Bill Gates has an incredible intellect. I think it could be argued that what he did with it changed the world. I think it pleases God that Bill Gates was a good steward of God's gift of intellect. Through his successes, he accumulated tremendous wealth. And he used that tremendous wealth to build one of the biggest single-family dwellings in the world. I don't think that that use of his wealth pleases God. However, in these last several years, he and his now ex-wife formed the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, whose tagline is, we are a nonprofit fighting poverty disease and inequity around the world. I think that pleases God. Is it your aim to please God? Paul wrote that all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Well, recompense is not a word that we use much. It means to make amends to someone for loss or harm suffered, to compensate. God is the giver of every good gift that God gives each one of us to steward. How are you doing with the gifts that God gave you? I don't ask that as a threat. I think Paul comes off threatening at times. I'm just reminding you that Paul wrote that we will have our moment in front of Jesus to give an accounting of what we did with what he first gave us. So how are you doing? He took a more positive tack later in the writing when he wrote, reminding the Corinthians, that the same Christ whom we must stand in front of to give recompense is the Christ who died for us out of his great love and obedience to God the Father. If the goal of heaven isn't enough, if pleasing God isn't enough, will the knowledge that Christ died in your place for your sins be enough? Enough to convince you that you don't live for yourselves or your children or your parents, important personal stewardship as that is. When Christ died on the cross, he took away all of our sins, and that made us new creations. The social rules that order this world do not apply to us because we are a new creation. Everything we may think had value in this temporal life will pass away. The only thing of value that we will take that we will take with us to our new eternal heavenly home is faith in Jesus Christ. And that knowledge, that realization, ought to change our motivation for everything we do. We ought to live for him. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, we give you thanks for the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul, whose tenacity you used to help spread the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Let his example inspire us to do all we can using the gifts you have first given us 
to further your kingdom and live into the idea that we are new creations. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. Let us pray. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from our ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved of God, in Jesus the manna from heaven, we are fed and nourished by Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, we are shown God's mercy. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. 
Holy God, fount of blessings, we pray for the church that the seeds of faith which you plant take root and grow, that those churches that are emerging from the pandemic regather their members in safety, and that you bless the church in places that are experiencing great distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the earth, that the trees and plantings in national forests be protected, that farms around the globe be safeguarded from drought, flood, and pestilence, and that wild animals thrive in the habitat they require. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations, that world leaders care for those in greatest need, that all prejudices cease, that the might of tyrants be halted, that journalists be kept safe from harassment, that the displaced find a welcome homeland, and that peace reign between nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the aged, that they are embraced by their relatives and friends, and that there are many needs be met. We pray for the children, that they be protected from harm and danger, and that some summertime give them opportunity to enjoy nature's bounty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for health and wholeness for countries where COVID-19 is accelerating and vaccines are not available, for relief agencies that are hungry to, to hungry be fed, for those who are beaten down by poverty and homelessness, for those who are suffering from climate disasters, for any who are sick with no access to medical care, and for those on our prayer list, our homebound, and those we now name before you either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who have died in faith, and for those whom we remember here before you, we offer our thanks, gracious Redeemer. For all who will die today, we ask your mercy, and at the end that we join with all your people in the perfection of your presence, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now please join in singing our sending hymn.
The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon us now and forever. Amen. You belong here. We belong together. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.